Hey, bub, play the theme music. Yo, 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 we back. What's going on, everybody? Once again, here's another one. This one is episode three of X Men 97. Recapping and analyzing everything in here like how we always do. But before we actually get into the episode, you know how we got to start this off. The foundation is the subscribers. You guys are all um, supporting in major ways. The likes, the shares, the comments, all that stuff. Um, it's beyond appreciated and it's what keeps this going. Um, this is going to happen regardless. It's not about all of those things, the analytics or the numbers or anything like that. It's really about educating. That's what the platform is about. MME educated. Manumitted minds educated. Um, now, before we get into this, like I said, we got to talk about the um, comments. I said this last time about is this stuff really related to reality? So for the first two episodes that we broke down, we really kind of focus on the civil rights movement, <clears throat> stuff with Professor X being like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, Magneto. We went through that thing. And it went from ep after episode one, it was probably 50 50 with the comments. And by episode two, it definitely is more like 80% to 20%, we could say probably. Uh, I'll just keep it at 75% to 25%. It's all they understand and they can see the same similarities that I'm breaking down. For the um, 25%, I appreciate you guys. For the ones who um, they're giving kickback and they're saying that this is impossible. There's no way that the civil rights movement and these African gods and all these other things can be related to X-Men 97. Um, some, I, I'm, there's one particular comment that I'm just gonna uh, mention because I think everyone should know this if y'all haven't seen this. There's um, someone broke down and he, um, or what the person, they um, copied and pasted um, when Marvel and all the writers, um, Everybody involved, Stanley and everybody, how, when he, when this was all created, and literally hit the point was, it's no way that this was connected to the civil rights movement because look when it was created, and it was created in 1963, uh, what he had. So the first thing that I wanted to say is, um, literally, <laughs> I'm trying to keep a straight face, but it was even funny to re respond to this, and the person clearly didn't re he didn't respond reply because. It was just facts. Um, I don't know why or what people think. I I'm assuming that um, they. I don't. I don't really know. I I'm assuming that people just because of all these years of Black History Month being focused on the same, just studying the same Black History. Um, I guess celebrities you want to call them, or um, I guess we could say legends. They're legends in their own right. So all these same ones, the Maya Angelos, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, um, you know, guys know. Um, and shout out to all of them. They are legends. But because we was kind of stuck in a box of only studying the same people. And that's I'm not just talking about like I'm talking about like like people who not considered black people who are black, whatever you are. Everybody is stuck in that same box of studying the same things. And I don't think we're realizing there's so much more that you should be studying and paying attention to. Long story short, the civil rights movement was a movement that literally is accredited as starting in the 50s. If you wanna give it an actual date, because movements, they're already in a rise and going on, but the kind of pivotal moment, if we wanna say of the civil rights movement, was absolutely before 1963, or whatever you think that the writers of Marvel and everybody came together and wrote this and the point is the main inspiration people like to say that the civil rights movement really started and showed power is with the montgomery bus boycott all right um so for for that once again before 1963 way before 1963 the point that i want to make though it's not about all of that 
the even in the Mount Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks now and Martin Luther King, this is when they, they, they get their most popularity. But Rosa Parks specifically, if you focus on the history of Rosa Parks, she specifically said her and everybody in the double NAACP, by the way, that is kind of who organized that to happen behind the scenes. They didn't want to take credit, whatever we'll get. That's a whole nother discussion. But the point is, this is what I'm saying. There's a lot of history about the civil rights movement that people don't really know, it seems obvious. And that's another reason why this is great to be able to have a platform to teach these things. But yeah, um, Rosa Parks lets it be known that when Emmett Till was assassinated the way Emmett Till was. Emmett Till, yes. The legendary and honorable Emmett Till for so-called whistling at a so-called white woman who therefore went and got her um, husband and brother to go ahead and get him out of his house or his the house that he was visiting. He's from Chicago and comes down to uh, Money, Mississippi, and he's visiting his family. There, his uncle thinks that he did something wrong, so the, the guys wanna just come and um, give him a spanking, what the uncle said. They brutally killed him. Y'all know the story. The mom, it was so bad that they, they, they was talking about you shouldn't have an open casket, but she was so strong and courageous. She said, no, Mommy Lewis, she's opened that casket and let the world see, and everybody got to see that image. And you can't forget that image. This is what is officially credited from the person who most people think are the people who credited it with starting the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks and everyone around said when that happened to Emmett Till, it was the wake up call initially for everybody. And they've been plotting and working on that. And the Montgomery bus boycott just happened to be the first official major strike that happened within that span. But nah, this was going down since 54. 58 is when organization happened. So in 1954 to 1958, major organization was really going on because of what happened to Emmett Till. And therefore, that's how that happened. So 1963, when this stuff was written, literally was off of seeing the rise of the civil rights movement. Literally, from Malcolm X being in jail to coming out by 63, Malcolm X was as major, if you can debate, literally who was more popular or known with Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. So both of them were major figures when the concepts of Professor X and Magneto were created. So yeah, just wanted to make that introduction clear and shout out to all of y'all. Now let's get into this episode three recap now. So first off, Fire Made Flesh. Fire Made Flesh, episode three. We gotta get into what the main themes are. There are actually a lot of main themes going on. Like main themes meaning that this stuff that we gotta, um, you have to break down. The first one is the concept of, as, as my, and this modern day right now, everyone right now, do you understand? It's so serious that we still kinda don't even know if you can really even say it really with, with, on, on the social media platforms. C19, so much going on with that and concepts and things going on where you can see all right there's some kind of um correlation here and for me personally besides this theme there are a lot of themes here that personally affect me and they personally i react to it and this is what when art and a cartoon can do that that is showing you how powerful these similarities of reality is but the whole c19 thing is going to be shown here and for anyone who was affected anyway like myself i had a major effect there's a lot of times i spoke about that but basically, career-wise, because I didn't want to walk that path of being tested and getting vaccinated and stuff like that, I wasn't really with that mandate stuff that was going on. Not really. I wasn't at all. And that caused a lot of things. So seeing this and seeing how C-19 got um, in, in put, um, put into the theme, that was brilliant from the writers once again. Now, another one is Dante's Inferno. A lot of people are not familiar with Dante's Inferno, so I love the fact that that's put in here. Um, even if you was into the comics, you kind of already got that with the Inferno X-Men. You know, Inferno was there, so this is kind of easy to see the pop, um, parale um, uh, parallels. It was kind of written to be like that, so writing it and showing it was easy. But for people who don't know about Dante's Inferno, this episode is going to basically perfectly explain it in a lot of ways, and we're going to break that down. Now, another theme is major again to me because personally 
I had some issues with this concept of who's real versus who fake and basically dealing with the history of Native Americans. Once again, a major back and forth. Check it out if y'all can see it and find it of one of the um, videos with the comments that I have is about the um, Wallum Olam. And it's, it's called the Red Book is the book of the history of the Native Americans, the original Native Americans and the original history. And there's so much big debate and topics about that. But from that history and showing where um, Native Americans originated from, long story short, that's what the book is really about. There's a lot of debate about that because some people don't like that that's being brought up because there are people who are pretending, faking, however you want to call it, to be of Native American ethnicity and origin just for profits, knowing that they have nothing to do with that um, lineage. So the concept of this is, is really subliminally put in there. But we're going to analyze and break that down and show how brilliant this was and powerful. Once again, the writing is to incorporate this concept like that. And a lot of people, we, you know, just in case it goes over your head, we're going to break it down. And for me personally, that's one of the reasons that, like I said, I just spoke about it with the whole C-19 thing. The whole restrictions and how the media held things back with information. This stuff with the Native Americans was a big deal as far as my Instagram. Um, at its height of my Instagram when I'm doing live teaching sessions and I have, you know, a, a kind of buzz going on with that because of what I was teaching about this specifically, that caused a lot of issues. So I'm not going to go deep into that. That's not what this video is about. But there's definitely something if you check out the saga that I'm doing on Mount Rushmore, you'll definitely kind of get an inside understanding of what I mean with Native American history. So another thing now we're going to bring up is the concept of a mad scientist who is credited with bringing up this concept of a mad scientist, evil scientist, evil genius. We all heard these terms. We're going to break this down and we're going to get into the concept of where this first started. It's going to kind of it's, it's a very mind blowing when you think about it. But the point is, this theme is all throughout here. What is a mad scientist? Where did it create, originate from? And seeing it live and direct. And then we also have to talk about World War II is coming, is full effect here. World War II was used throughout a lot of media. Things that have been covered in movies, cartoons, they have been subliminally putting in it through it. One of the major ones, and people don't kind of really fully understand yet, but World War II absolutely, completely influenced Star Wars. And that's another thing to talk about another time. But yeah, if you don't know, doubt, and if you're a fan of Star Wars, you're going to really love it when you realize how directly it is related to World War II. Amazing. World War II comes up here in a gruesome way, one of the worst ways. And I can understand in some types, in some ways, why it's kind of hidden. But then also from a very phenomenal close friend, I learned um, that it's kind of more popular than I thought. <laughs> it's in movies right now. The, the uh, concept that we're gonna discuss, well, in a series, a very popular series, American Horror Story. So we're gonna talk about that. And last but not least, we gotta think about the cliffhanger of episode two because that cliffhanger is directly going to relate to another theme as well. Remember the cliffhanger here. You know, Morph, is, he opens the door from hearing the ring, and Jean is there hurt and says, I need help, I need the X-Men, and falls in his hands, and they're confused because there's another Jean in the back with the baby and Cyclops. So yeah, when the, how that whole thing ended, um, ended that cliffhanger is going to lead into a major theme. You can see it already. If there's two, they look alike. The concept of a clone, AI technology, robots taking over and things of that nature. This is here. This is here. And keep that question in mind because, like I said, these themes, they're not just for this episode. The reason why they're called major themes and brought up right here in the introduction and letting you know what's to come is because they're going to lead into moving forward with this series. So with that being said, let's get into the first scene of the episode. Now, here we go, right off the bat, the first part of this. Remember, fire made flesh. Fire made flesh. X-Men 97, Episode 3. 
the first part of this, we gotta say, we could call this, who is the real Jean Grey? Who is the real Jean Grey? So right here in this scene, um, from the beginning on the cliffhanger, they're trying to figure out, all right, this Jean that just came at the door is all hurt. Got her in the couch, they're trying to figure out what's going on, what's happening here. So with all the confusion going on, everybody trying to question and figure out what's happening here, Jean decides to read the mind of this new Jean. So when she reads the mind, she goes in and she figures out and realizes that, wait a minute, this Jean has an authenticity to her. And it actually, I could feel her memory. She actually really is telling the truth. She really does need help and is really seeking the X-Men. All I can receive from her memory, this is basically what the Jean is saying. She's like, all I can see from her memory is that she was in some type of laboratory on some type of table and she got up from whatever was going on, some type of science was happening. She got up from this and she went straight to seek the X-Men. And the way it was set up was like, oh, she might be here to actually hurt the X-Men. But she's like, no, I don't really feel that. And as she's really trying to go deeper into the memories, bam, something happens and it's interrupted. So just like we seen in that other episode, that episode one, when Master Mode um, stopped her when Jean was using Cerebro, once again, now she's not using cere Cerebro, but something stops her, interrupts her um, tele um, tele um, kinetic powers, telepathic powers. So now, um, once she gets here and they finish this and she's, she's interrupted, the, um, the Jean is not there, but now they're like, wait, what's going on? So if this person is a real Jean, like what's going on? Who's the real Jean? And this is hilarious because they can't trace this new gene. Like Beast is doing all, or, or Beast is starting to do his tests, and it's like, I can't really, the only thing I can tell you right now is that um, this is some type of, we got some type of real serious situation. Both of them have the same type of, um, so far it looks like both of them, both of them are real gene. Both of them are real genes, basically is what Beast is saying. So then like Morph is like, yo, what's going on here? So. What should we do here? Um, should we call them Gene Doe? And this is hilarious because this is when Morph makes his first change and we have major themes to discuss in this in itself. So first off, before we even get into that, think about what we're talking about right now. Who's the real Gene? Both of them showing some type of proof. Think about what I'm saying. Both genes, even from Beast, with his initial test is saying that both of these are showing signs that both of them are actually Gene. What does that remind you of in reality? The Pretendians. Yes, Pretendians. Many people are not familiar with Pretendians, but let's break this down. Pretendians is a term that's used, as you can see here. It's you, basically, long story short, there was a term that was being used and was very popular. Um, they had different variations of it, but something like a $2 Native American or a $2 Indian. And that was a name, it was basically viewed derogatorily as something to call somebody who was trying to um, infiltrate Native American reservations and get re different resources to act like they're Native American. So they would buy um, some type of um, proof that or evidence that they are natives and two dollars maybe i guess that was the number that was most popular that I was paying for it so they can get free land and things like that so that's where we get this concept so pretending that that concept was given that was like a how the world was basically saying the nation was basically calling these people right from the native side they were basically straight up pretendians you're pretending to be what we are like i said indian we're not gonna really get too deep into that without that term and how it's it's yeah, Native Americans is what we're talking about. Um, but the point is, these people and this concept of who's real and is fake, nobody really wants to see from both sides as somebody who's into debate, as a debate coach and a winner tournament, shout outs to the um, squad. Um, as, as we really think about this on both sides, they both really did have proof of why they should be considered Native Americans. So even though I'm with the, the natives when they call them pretendians, you, you, if you're not really from this lineage, I don't care how much you pay and what you what certificate you think you have to verify, you're not one of these people. But at the same time, on the law of the land, and if you're being non-biased, if you just have to judge the situation, if somebody has 
some type of documentation that we view as official documentation and it certifies that they are from a certain lineage whether we have any type of other evidence or not that is something that you have to acknowledge and then on the same hand people who live on the land have the ancestry the photos the lineage the stories the books they have everything they know the tradition they know the culture they know the people around their community all these things but they don't have that verifiable documentation it doesn't matter they clearly are original and native americans as well so both sides have an argument of course most people you think about in the long run the ones who authentically are from the culture and the lineage they have to be the one who get the claim but sad to say just like how people don't know the true history of mount rushmore people don't know the true history of what's going on with the native american population and how pretendians really did get to take over land and they that never changed that's just the reality profited heavily off of that and still do um not to mention any names but people if you just look at fox news just to throw this out there and I'm not just saying Fox, but one of the fun funniest ones is when Gutfield talks about Warren, um, Elizabeth Warren. He kind of openly jokes about how she's somebody who comes from that side of claiming she's a Native American. So I'm not going to get too deep into that. Y'all can look into that yourselves. The point of that now is when Morph makes that change into Spiral, now he makes this joke about, yo, um, who thinks that we should call her Jean Grey now, Jean Doe now? And he raises the all of the hands of um, Spyro. This is when we got to get into who does Spyro really correlate with in history, right? And Spyro is directly connected to Hindu deities now. We went from the African deities, now Spyro. Spyro, for those who don't know about Spyro, Spyro is someone who basically um, has a history with Mr. Sinister. That will come up later. It's funny how they put that in here early. But basically, Mr. Sinister punished her and made her a protector of his or a defender for him. And that's why she's got the arms and the extra arms. And it was she viewed it as a curse. And that is one of her storylines trying to get out the curse of um Mr. Sinister that and blah 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 moving forward. Right? She's not the only one. It was a group of them, but we're talking about one at a time. And Spyro now. Check out in Hindu culture, who is Durga? Yeah, Durga. Isn't this in isn't this phenomenal? From the arms, you check that out. From the same weaponry, check that out. The you see the the protect the energy, the um tiger, lion. The whole concept of being a protector. It's phenomenal how they fuse that spiral, Durga, phenomenal. And it's like a real brief second, gave a nice joke there with the Gene though, all hands up, raise your hand with spiral. But look into that. We, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see more spiral. Um, but yeah, let's move on to this. Just wanted to break that down. Um, now, getting back into the storyline now, Beast now is trying to work on Gene splicing. Yeah. Gene splicing on Gene Gray. Yeah, it sounds that way for a reason. Beast is working on Gene splicing. Who in history or in our legacies of stories and um, concepts that is broken down and studied from elites do we know for doing Gene splicing? How about Yaku? How many of you know the true story and roots of Yaku? Gene splicing. Not going to get too deep into that. Um, once again, we already spoke about how the Nation of Islam was already studied to do with the, the neck collars and, and things of that nature. Now, is it that far-fetched that in those studies they learned about Yakub? And the writers figured out a brilliant way. And look at G look at Beast in the picture. Not saying that Beast has an abnormally large head like Yakub, but definitely does, especially standing up right here. Short, big head, working on gene splicing. It is an, it's phenomenal. For those who know about Yakub, you already know. But Yakub, basically, the story is that Yakub was this evil genius scientist. Big headed scientist is what they was he was known for. So when it was basically this is part, part the story is that long, long, long ago, when it was that wasn't that many people, it was only 
this is the story. I'm just telling you the story. And this story, we should be accredited to Elijah Muhammad. Shout outs and everybody Elijah Muhammad and anybody who's fought under the Nation of Islam or Muslim, shout outs. But now Elijah Muhammad spoke about how when they were all just black people on the planet. Um, and they all powerful, God-like, we can say, right? Pure. They, one of them, an evil scientist, he got mad at how the rest of them weren't, or leaders or whatever, weren't treating him, basically. So he went off into, we can say, the Caucasoid Mountains, and he started doing some gene splicing, and he taken the lightest skins that he was taking some of the, he was basically experimenting with some of the lightest skinned, the most light skinned of the dark people. He had them create a baby, gene spice and made a baby out of them. Then took the lighter ones from them and then kept, he kept on making different generations of different beings that had lighter hue all the way until he got down to making what we call today the Caucasian. So basically, um, Yakub is credited for his gene splicing of making all of the nations across the planet. That's basically how the story goes. Beside God, so basically telling from the story of Elijah Muhammad, and I'm just paraphrasing, of course, it's a whole lot in between, and there's a lot of different ways that the story is broken now, but this is clearly and definitely the story for the most part. Yakub basically was created, black people were basically created um, from God, and then Yakub basically created the other nations. That's basically how the storyline goes. So Gene Spicen, Yakub, that's kind of, uh, it's phenomenal how that was brought in together. So that had to have, it was a standout moment and that we just had to break that down. So moving right along now, the new Gene is actually the real Gene. Beast finds out that with cellular proof, there's no doubt about it. The clone gene is the gene that's been there with them the whole time with the baby, with Nathan and Cyclops. This whole, so for the first two episodes, every time we seen Jay with the Cerebro and all that stuff, telling Cyclops while she was pregnant, they should leave, all that stuff, this same gene Gray has been the clone the whole time. So now everybody's like, whoa, wait a minute. Now, it was it went it was different when they realized both of them were real. They just thought that somehow they got duplicated. But now one of them actually, I mean, whatever they thought, I don't even know how to break that down really. But whatever they thought, they were comfortable. But once they realized, no, one of them is actually older, meaning the real Jean. She's been alive the whole time. Jean's supposed to be alive. The other one is not that her, the cellular structure is is pretty new, even though she has all the memories and thoughts and powers of the real Jean. So it's a, it, they were just mind blown. But at this time, first Gene goes from being confused to actually getting mad. And Cyclops goes from being, well, Cyclops just stays confused the whole time. So he's just conflu confused. Everybody's trying to figure out, wait, what's really happening right now? And then Magneto was like, yo, listen, Beast, I know this is all confusion, but we need to make sure we run some tests because Gene starts breaking down how, yo, all the stuff I sacrificed for y'all, y'all treating me like this? This is how it's going down? So Magneto's like, yo, nah, you know what? Go ahead and um, make sure you do some more test beasts and let's make sure we prove this without a reasonable doubt because we just can't throw Jean under the bus like that. She means too much. Jean just snaps like, nah, get out of here. Blast the whole, um, she used her powers to blast the whole test thing that Beast was trying to give to her away, cracks it on the whole thing and then on the wall, and walks up to the Cyclops and takes the baby. And Cyclops, like, stuck, confused, don't know what to think, because he's really he's really lost. And then she's like, yo, if Storm was here, she wouldn't, she wouldn't treat me like this. She'll listen to me. And it just reminds me of how I remember that girl talk that her Storm and Jean had that last episode. So it's kind of crazy how they tying this stuff together. Really, really excellent writing, like I keep saying. But at this time, I thought it was just interesting that they know that she's the clone, but they just let her take the baby. So that was a little, uh, it was, okay, y'all X-Men and y'all, I guess y'all monitoring and all that. Y'all feel y'all like y'all powerful enough, but that was just interesting. So she takes um, um, Nathan away, the baby, and Cyclops, she's in the room alone, like talking to Nathan, like, yo, I don't believe that this is happening to me. Like, we should have been just left them. We shouldn't have let this happen. Like, how did it get this bad? And Cyclops comes in like, yo, listen, I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to think. I'm confused, but like, yo, let me get Nathan from you so you can just have your own time. 
So it's like, he's trying to make it seem like, yo, I'm just trying to be help, be helpful and I'm gonna take the baby so you don't have to think about the baby. But clearly, it's like, yo, you just don't trust me right now when you just wanna take the baby away. And Gene's not really having that. But yo, one of the funniest parts about it is Gene is looking at Cyclops as he's talking and she's like, yo, Gene, I like Cyclops. You never lied to me before because you know I can read your mind. Like, you, if I'm, I'm reading your mind, like, why are you lying to me right now? And Cyclops just stuck, like, oh, snap, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have lied about that. I really don't trust you. So basically, he had to just leave. It was it was a wrap for him. So once he leaves, Storm is just there again. She's like, yo, this is bad. We should have really just left. This is, make no sense. She here with the baby. And that's when it gets, it starts to go down here. The baby monitor starts to talk. So you hear a voice looking for Storm. What's going on? What's going on? And the baby monitor basically is saying, "Yo, I'm somebody who you should know. You shouldn't have. You shouldn't have forgot me." And Storm is like, "This. This is basically at this time. We. This is like. I mean, I'm saying Storm, Jean. So Jean at this time, she's here. The baby. She with the baby. The baby monitor starts going off now. And Mr. Sinister is basically there. He comes out, and they find out." is Mr. Sinister. He comes out, he shows his face, reveals himself a little bit in the background. Um, and then he's basically like, listen, I'm your father. I'm the one who created you. So you need to um, come back home, basically. So now at this same time, Bishop is ready to unite. Bishop is like, yo, it's time for me to go back into um, the future and take care of my loved ones. I got to unite with people. They need me back here. And Beast is like, listen, we almost done with your machine, but we got to take care of Gene right now. This is the most, this is the biggest emergency. We got to make sure we figure this out. So while this is going down, um, Beast realizes that, wait a minute, I just figured something out. This actually is somebody who is a scientist and I know who he is. And he's somebody who's very sinister. So when this happens, you just got to think, we saw that flash of Mr. Sinister, Beast with the sinister thing. Who is a sinister scientist? So at this time, they're really breaking down. All right, he's this evil scientist. Where did the concept of an evil or mad scientist originate from? Yeah, Frankenstein. Now, this is a really deep subject and concept to break down, but we must take some time to think about this. First off, from the time Frankenstein came out, it was brilliant it was brilliant it was loved but there was a lot of confusion like most of let's start off with the fact that most people think that this book or this this story is all about the person who was created being named frankenstein the monster and we already know wasn't really that evil had a gentle side and things like that but the point is that <laughs> The doctor, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, is the person who created the monster. So that's one thing that I thought was a phenomenal part about this. Yeah, let's actually give credit to the person who this is, who actually is behind this. So now, as we say that, even though Dr. Victor um, um, Frankenstein, now this, this fictional character, is the one who's known as the mad scientist. Yes, this character is where we ori this originates from. But Mary Shelley, Sister Shelley, this all comes down when she was 19 years old. When she was 19 years old, wrote this phenomenal story. This everlasting story right here that still to this day, it still causes confusion and still has influence. And it's right here with the X-Men 97 series. So shout outs to Mary Shelley, the um, originator and the person who coined the phrase mad scientist with Dr. Victor Frankenstein creating this so-called monster. Same thing that Beast is basically saying that he figured out who's behind this clone. It's somebody who is a scientist that is sinister. And we got a picture from knowing a, like knowing a whole storyline they didn't really completely announce it yet in the episode, but we know that this is Mr. Sinister and Mad Scientist. So let's move forward before we get we really get deep into Mr. Sinister. Now, the clone gene actually starts to talk to Mr. Sinister the, the, in, the, in the monitor. And then as they're talking, he's like, listen, yeah, I'm your father. You think that this is a joke? I'm not joking. I'm really here. You're mine. He basically goes into her mind and reminds her that, yo, 
you are my, I'm really the person who made you. Look, and he goes into her mind and shows her the lab. Put the, he put his, oh, and that's another thing. We're gonna get into that. We are really into the Hindu um, concepts now. You notice that third eye on Mr. Sinister? Yeah, keep that in mind. The Hindu culture, we went from the African um, culture and all of that stuff that we spoke about with the first two episodes and the civil rights movement. And now we into the Hindu. And shout outs to everybody who um, followed, who's under that branch. This is another brilliant way of writing to show how Hinduism is influencing this series right here. So now he puts the, he shows how he put the um, third eye red gem thing in um, Jean Grey's mind. And that's how she got up or that's how she was created. And he did his scientist stuff. And now when she realizes that, like, wait, hold up. He just awoken this, the true darkness inside the clone. So now the clone transforms into an evil clone Jean Grey now. And yeah, we're gonna get into that, of course. Now moving on now, this whole first scene, this is a long, this is the, this was the longest scene of the um uh, of the of the um uh, episode. So now this basically ends now. Deep. Wolverine, Gambit, and Morph, they're leaving the danger room. So now the last time we seen Gambit, basically, he was highly upset about what happened with Rogue messing with uh, Magneto. So Right from the beginning, they come out the danger room, and Morph is like, "Wow, Gambit, take it easy! Like you, you, you destroyed me." And Gambit is kind of like ego tripping, like, "Yeah, you know, this is what I do. Like any next time you want a rematch, just let me know." So Morph is like, "Oh yeah, you, 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 you go in. So how about this? Let me go check to see when we can set up a danger room meeting." So Morph goes and checks the danger room calendar, and as he's clicking through, he's like, "Wow, Rogue and Magneto, Rogue and Magneto got a whole bunch of sessions um lined up. Wait a minute, they keep they they got tomorrow, they got today, they got next week, they got and then as he's doing this, he's like, "Wow, I guess um I guess Rogue is really trying to show Magneto her boss her true stamina." So Gambit is just like losing his mind and upset. He's like, "Nah," he starts actually he just starts to show that he's in denial. He's like, "Nah, this is no true. There's no way that that's true." My um Rogue loves me. Rogue wouldn't do that. And he goes and say, I'm gonna go find Rogue right now and prove that that's not true. So Gambit leaves from the danger room and he goes to find Rogue. Upset. Wolverine is like, yo, I gotta go talk to Gene. Whoever the real Gene is, I gotta go figure out what's going on with that. I know the real Gene. So Wolverine goes to talk to Gene. And then Morph, he just left alone. And he's like, yeah, all right. Morph, Wolverine, like, yo, go take a shower. So Morph, it basically ends. <clears throat> scene basically ends where Morph is like kind of upset that everybody just left them and at, and this time it's like we seeing different we seeing Morph is showing they're showing a lot of different variations of Morph happy joking and but when he don't have anybody around it's showing that he has an attachment to people so Morph they're showing we're going to get into this it's kind of going to be it's not a major thing that we're going to follow too much but we're seeing a lot of psychological trauma and different things that other people going through these type of menta mental states they can relate to. So if you got that mentality of being attached and always want to be around in the party and always want to be, you know, part of something, you got that, um, you don't want to miss out on anything. If you got that kind of stuff going on, this is what Morph is showing you and it doesn't really pay off. But of course, you got to accept it and learn how to deal with it. That's what life is. But love yourself. Go into the mirror and just be happy that you woke up. Every day you wake up, it's like winning or receiving. Every day you wake... Here we go. Every day that you wake up is like receiving a winning lottery ticket. Go into the mirror. Say that to yourself. Be proud, be grateful, and understand you have the power to do anything you need and want to do in your life. And you don't need anybody. But you can have people around that are like-minded and like-spirited to move forward with you as a union. So yeah, that's how that scenes end off. And now, like I said, that was the longest one. Now let's get into somewhere, some of the scenes where the drama is starting to rise. Here we go. Now, here we go with scene two. This is where each X-Men is experiencing their worst fears. This one gets real deep. It starts off with Morph went to take a shower, right? So as Morph is in the shower room, he's going and he's locking he in his locker room, whatever, getting his stuff together. He hears that somebody else is already in the shower and they turn the shower on and the steam is going on. So he's confused, like, wait a minute. I, I thought I was all alone. So what happens is, 
Morph gets extra excited at the thought of somebody being there. Then when he starts to look, he thinks it's Wolverine. So now we, he's got this extra excitement. He pulls the, he starts to act like he's turning into Wolverine, pulls the claws out, and he's walking into the shower, and then he realizes this person is like saying one, one, some of the worst things to him. And it's like showing that he's like, I'm not here to play. You play too much. You, all you want to do is play. I don't like you. I don't, you, you, you upsetting me. And it's like, it's showing more real worst fear is when he really wants to play with his best friend. The best friend really is not, is upset with him and hates him. And right at the last minute, he realizes that, oh, this is Mr. Sinister. And we're going to get into that. But Morph clearly shows that he already knows about Mr. Sinister. So now the next one is Gambit. He's walking to go find Rogue. So he sees the doors crack and the light is on. So he's like peeking into the room. And as he looks into the room, he opens the door and Rogue and Magneto are basically there making love. And Rogue looks at him. They look at him and he's like, wait, this is some type of worst nightmare going on. And as that happens, they basically are like, "Yeah, get out of here. You're not, you're not man enough. Um, go back to your, go back to the country." So it's like Gambit's worst fears. Then we see Jubilee and um, Roberto. They sitting back. They just watching the movie, one of their little um teenager type of movies. And their worst fear comes out as the movie starts to turn into real life, and it's coming out of the screen. So as it's coming out the screen, it's attacking them. Jubilee is blasting it with her, you know, her, her Jubilee sparkle little things. And then it ends up turning into first Jubilee's um mom. And then she blasts that. Then it goes right into Roberto and turns into Roberto's mom. And she's screaming at him and yelling at him. And like, I'm disappointed in you. How did you turn out to be like this? Like you mutant scum. You you so you're worthless. And just saying all these worst things. And like I said, it's showing all of the X-Men's worst fears. This is building up to something. It even gets down to Bishop and Bishop and um, Cyclops. They're together now. And as they're together, all of a sudden, Cyclops, he sees Professor X. Bishop sees his sister. So it's this big being that's coming and grabbing him. This Professor X thing, it looked like it got the, it, it's calling it. I don't, I'm pretty sure it's so, it's the Professor X like demon type of thing, as you can see. And he's calling like Demetrius. I think that's Bishop's name. I need to look into that, figure it out. Or maybe that's like he's some maybe somebody's I don't know, because we know Scott Summers. So I didn't understand that who he was saying. But I think there's some storyline behind why the professor in this new stage who knows all their dark fears or whatever is saying Demetrius. So um, Bishop, his sister pops out and is like, yo, how can you just like leave us and you're not coming back? And so it's, like I said, all their worst fears. But Cyclops is like, yo, you, uh, Professor X is like, you're not a leader. You're, you, you just worthless. You're too immature. Saying all of their worst fears. So by the time they kind of blast the stuff away. Oh, and by the way, can't forget, even Beast. Beast, he's just going to the lap. He's just going to the elevator. And it's this big, nasty monster there. But for Beast, Beast kept calm. That's what's interesting. He kept calm and nothing really happened to him. And that shows something about your fears. Here's the point before we get into this. With your fears, fears are something that you should be using as motivation. If something fears you, let it you, let your new drive be to get rid of that fear. Not to let the fear consume you. Use the fear as fuel to destroy whatever is fearing you. And destroy the concept of the fear. Not really destroy what's fearing you. But destroy whatever you are interpreting as something that should make holding you back and consuming you with that. No, be proud of conquering your fear and hold it as a trophy when you conquer it. So that what I think is the most powerful thing about this scene. But now when we really get down to this, they all meet back in the room in the middle of the mansion. And Morph is like, they all like, yo, what's going on? This is all the worst thing ever. We can't, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And Morph is the only one who realizes, yo, y'all don't realize it? We're in hell. So they all, the second he says that, they all realize, wait, he's saying something, the tree's saying something truthful. And everybody in the mansion drop Morph is, oh yeah, Morph lets it break before they drop. Morph is like, we in hell. And I know who's behind it. It's Mr. Sinister. And then they all just drop. Now, this is where we get interesting with another one of those main themes. Dante's Inferno. A lot of people, like I said earlier, 
They're not really fully aware of Dante's Inferno, even though it's been put out there in different ways. A lot of different movies, cartoon shows highlighted it. And, you know, it's been talked about, but the book has been written, rewritten, and all over. It's pushed around in colleges, everywhere. We already know that it exists. But the concepts, a lot of people don't really actually read. So purgatory is what this is really all about. And it's basically the different stages and levels that you got to go through before you get into actual hell. So purgatory, Dante's Inferno, basically is written about this stage. It's between earth and hell. So it's different stages and you're seeing different people who are trapped or like in, in between here. And they're all basically these demons. So keep this in mind. They're not necessarily, they haven't reached hell yet, but they're like demon spawns that are just around there, trapped and in, in this, they're possessed. It's a real deep concept, but it's gonna be really highlighted throughout this episode, as you can see with the pictures. You can look at Dante's Inferno, these pictures from the beginning all the way around. You can see the the, the different, it's like, um when you think of like um the worst, the worst things that you can think of, that's what this is about. The worst died, like if you look at all the old school pictures of Dante's Infernos, different images that people had of the different scenes and the stuff that was spoke about to the stuff now that's modern with the X-Men right here, same type of things going on. But this was a powerful scene right here, getting back into the actual show. Right here, they having a major fight with the demons. Now, right from the beginning, they all falling and they jumping off, they, 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 they you know, they going through their motions back and forth. Um, the best things that happen is when Cyclops and Bishop, they use their powers together and it was phenomenal how that whole thing happened. Long story short, like Bishop is first, he's shooting his guns and he's like, all right, yo, Cyclops, hit me. So when he said that, like, okay, this is fire. He blast his eye, Cyclops give him a big blast of his eye blast and as he blasts um as he blasts bishop with the um um eye blast he or he's blasting him bishop is just absorb absorbing all of that energy and once he finishes he max out he just lets loose and he's like yo this is an exorcist like i said this is like the hell so we got the whole concepts of religion spirit spirituality christianity so exorcism it's you know it's all ties in with this dante's inferno concept so that's what bishop is doing and he wipes out a whole load and he kind of clears a way for the x-men to like have some breathing spoke breathing space but as soon as he does this that's when clone gene they realize clone gene because they're like yo we, everybody said that Mr. Sinister is in, involved with all this, but how can Mr. Sinister know all of our deepest, darkest secrets? How can he have this power and be that have this much control and he's not even around? Then they realize, oh no, Gene is right here. It's this evil Gene. And this evil Gene now comes down and, yo, she just destroys them. Basically, first, they're confused and we see Cyclops is like, yo, what? Hold up. How can you be doing this to us? And right when she's about to blast them, let them know, listen, I'm the Goblin Queen. I'm here. That's my name. She's like the savior or the protector of, she's like the main, like I said, Dante's Inferno, the Purgatory. There's a bunch of demons. She's basically the queen leader of the Goblin Demons, Goblin Queen. So that's who this new clone gene is. Clone gene for Mr. Sinister now transformed to Goblin Queen. But right as she arrives, or I mean, right when she's there, or she leaves basically because the real Jean from her hospital, or the, I mean, you know, with her hospital gown on, the gown on, and she's in the rested and healing, she comes out and protects him, saves him at the last minute, right when the spawns, the demon spawns, is about to wild up on him again. So Jean basically pushes her away, and Goblin Queen is like, listen, I knew you was going to come save him, but I don't understand how Cyclops is still interested in you. Seems like the clone gene or goblin queen still loves Cyclops. There's something there. It's interesting right from the beginning. But basically, goblin queen is like, yo, I'm out of here. I'm going back to my real home with Sinister. And if y'all want it, if y'all want me, come get me. I know where I'm at. And she just leaves. So that was big because now Magneto and Rogue enter at the last minute. And they're like, hey, what's going on? What did we miss? Crazy thing is. Gambit kind of shows that he maybe have some proof and truth to what he was saying. 
Gambit is beat up and hurt from that battle with the um with the um demons and Goblin Queen. Rogue immediately runs over to Gambit and like, oh sugar, what's going on? I'm so sorry to see you like this. And he's trying to um she's trying to help him out. Magneto just ignores it and like, yo, what's going on? This is when Morph breaks down one of the most important themes here. Mr. Sinister's true roots. The true roots of Mr. Sinister. So Morph is basically breaking down. He's this 1800, um, he's a scientist from the 1800. And all he was trying to do was um, trying to create like a human, a, a, new, um, a, new, a new mutant species based off of old um, mutants because he basically wanted to prolong life. So he using this science to try to prolong life and try to use other mutants to do some science and gene stuff, whatever. And who does this remind us in actual history? World War II. We all know about the Holocaust. For some reason, what's happening right now in history, we can see no there's different ways of having geno having genocide go on which the holocaust clearly was but we're witnessing a different type of genocide happen in the world no need to say any names at this point it's so bad that we don't even have to say any names there's only one place in the world where we can see something like that happening there's different ways they're not doing the genocide the same thing, that same way that World War II was popularized. And that's why this is so important to talk about. The way that Moore explains who Mr. Sinister is as an evil scientist is just like Joseph Mengele from World War II. The Auschwitz evil mad scientist. One of the most tragic stories when we really start to break this down and get into who this person is. This evil scientist is someone who goes under the radar, mainly in my opinion, because he wasn't on the Nuremberg trials. Now this is why this World War II discussion is important. Shout out to all my students who already, we already, they understand how deep this conversation goes and they're probably watching and listening to this and they understand where we, we don't need, I don't even have time to go that deep, but we're gonna we have to touch on some of these tough subjects. So what after World War II, many people are not familiar with the reality of Operation Paperclip, a military operation to basically quote unquote move scientists from um, from Germany and the Nazi regime, from harm's way out of that warfare before the, the before the whole house of cards crumbled and moved them to America. Deep, deep story. If you look into when Operation Paperclip supposedly happened, and then you look at when the World War II ended, and then you look at the documents that they have on Joseph Mengele, He's found in Latin America. Y'all already know. If you don't know, pay attention to the channel. Argentina, Latin America, Hitler. Not to get that deep into no conspiracies and all that, but it's very interesting how they put Mr. Sinister in here and the same type of concepts. We're going to see how it just keeps on. The parallels with Joseph Mengele are very, very deep. Long story short, Joseph Mengele. Everybody talk about the Holocaust, how they just was burning people, the gas chambers, um, hunger, killing, just shooting. Joseph Mengele had a whole different assignment. Joseph Mengele had the elites of the world scared because he was trying to make and create a superhuman race of Aryans. He's trying to use the people throughout that Holocaust experiments was being experimented by Joseph Mengele and all of his people and his group and underling. They were trying to figure out how to gene splice and use steroids and different type of um, science um, tricks, basically tricks of the trade to convert the abilities of one to another and create this super Aryan making super soldiers they use in science to try to create super soldiers to win the world war. 
And what is Mr. Sinister breaking down doing? Mr. Sinister is trying to use science to make mutants or make the perfect mutants combine. Long story short, he took Jean Grey, the clone, had Jean Grey go ahead and make a baby with Cyclops. Cyclops and Jean Grey have a new child. This child has new powers. That power and that child has a connection with Mr. Sinister. Mr. Sinister basically is the child Nathan's granddad. Mr. Sinister is basically Cyclops' um, um, stepfather. Yeah, it gets real deep when you think about it. And this is how the concept is with these people that Chris created. While Joseph Mengele was trying to make these super soldiers, he's not just killing he's not just killing the minorities or the Jews or other other people. Like I said, it's people we talk about the six million Jewish people who died and shout outs and um um salutes and all blessings to the families and loved ones that was lost and the people who survived after that in memory. But it was 12 million or more than at, up at least 12 million people all together that was killed. So it was six non-Jewish people, six million non-Jewish people that were killed too. That was mixed with all different nationalities that were in Germany. So yeah, my whole point is, it wasn't just Jewish people who were being killed by Joseph Mengele because many people died with these experiments. They might have perfected certain things that are being used today, like the concepts. We understand, a lot of people don't realize this, but we really know that cigarette smoke and nicotine um they actually are causing cancer they're cancer causing because they made they forced people to smoke cigarettes to experiment with them or use different things to inject a certain amount to see how much of this stuff can hurt and cause cancer that actual science comes from these evil scientists that's just the reality that can be researched on its own so they were using their own people. They were using everybody to try to figure out all of their different scientists things. And a lot of things that they use, sad to say, it's still used and beneficial today. That's kind of the, the weirdest thing about it. But that's how the planet works. And this is when we're dealing with spirituality and universal laws. No matter how bad you are, no matter how evil you think you are, you're still working for us. And some way long that in a long story, People who don't smoke cigarettes, that's how deep it is. This evilness, you can you can say, all right, you know that not seeing that stuff was evil and horrible, but the knowledge that we have from that comes from that regime. So evilness is never gonna win. You're always gonna lose, we're always gonna override. Powerful discuss, discussion, but this all comes from what happened with Morph bringing up who the what, what the true origins of Mr. Sinister and his evil scientist ways was all about. Very, very, very deep stuff. So, like I said, in conclusion, Mr. Sinister trying to initially start off by prolonging life and using experiments. Now he went to, he's trying to gene splice to make the perfect or strongest type of invincible mutant army. Joseph Mengele with the Nazi regime and Auschwitz, he was trying to gene splice, use steroids and different experiments to make the perfect Aryan nation soldiers. Yeah, deep stuff. Now, just to end off this second scene right here, Morph is letting them know and showing them he is actually an ex-victim of Mr. Sinister. That's how he knows so much about Mr. Sinister. It's some deep stuff right there. He's actually the one that's going to say, hey, listen, I know where Mr. Sinister lives. We're going to go there right now. So as he, he says that, the team basically is like, all right, we got to figure out what's going on. Magneto going to come up with a plan. He realizes Jean is still hurt and she's lost, even though she just saved them from the Goblin Queen, but she used all her powers and she still hurt. So Magneto like, yo, basically, this is how we gonna do this. We understand the um, the lab, we know the plan, we know that we gotta go get Nathan. We understand what's going on with the Goblin Queen, um, Wolverine, you and Beast, y'all stay back with Gene, make sure y'all take care of things. I'm gonna take the other X-Men and we gonna go ahead because he's trying to make a new breed of mutants and it's been too long. We have to get rid of Mr. Sinister now. So Magneto is absolutely standing on business and that's how the scene ends. They about to head out. So let's get into the next scene. Now, as far as action is concerned, we had a lot of action in that second scene, but this is where it hits the top right here. Now we get a lot, it just gets real intense with action, literally. Every pretty much scene, part of this. So the X-Men starts off arriving at Mr. Sinister's mansion or his location. So 
they get there and right from the time they open the door they end nice and easy goblin queen listen goblin queen is showing it like you the way gene gray gene gray is you know gene gray is just always cool calm collective thinking things out goblin queen is really the antithesis like the opposite like just just swagging flowing Yo, I'm here. I've been waiting for y'all. I ain't know if y'all was gonna come, but I'm pretty sure because of Cyclops, y'all had to come. Y'all was gonna come for me and that's baby no matter what. So they trying to like warn her and Cyclops like, listen, you gotta get off of off Mr. Sinister's spell. He trying to talk her through it and be all humble and nice thinking that he could talk her through it because this is my wife and we got a child together. First person she blasted away, knocked them out of here was Cyclops. Like one hit, knocked them out of here. So he just blasted away from the beginning. And that's when the scene basically gets down. Morph gets into his second transformation. So now he transforms into, and by the way, we got to talk about this, of course, magic. Magic. Now, everybody knows that when they had the different um, Russian or different, they got, like I said, the right in the international concepts, stuff that was going on with the Cold War, Russia, um, and the Soviet Union, really, we should say, got heavily involved with the writing and the concepts. Um, so from the beginning, of course, so Colossus is one of the major ones. We spoke about Colossus. Now we have the second one from that same umbrella, Magic. And she could hear her. She's speaking in Russian, like, um, it's like trying to convince Jean to Morph is really good with, and they, they did real good with the way they blended Morph. And, um, it made it relatable. It gave, it pushed storylines forward. But like I said, let's get into Morph. I mean, on magic, when Morph turned into magic. Magic now, let's pay attention to magic. Magic right here, just cool, relaxed with the just regular clothes on, is normal. When magic now, I mean, when um, magic tries as, I'm see, it's crazy because Morph turns into magic. So yeah, I'm gonna speak to the person he turned into. Magic tries to attack Goblin Queen. Goblin Queen easily stops that, grabs her by like the third eye or something like that, and takes the powers away well not take the powers away turns morph from back into regular from magic into regular morph again turn evil kind of got that Mr. got a sense to look on him and then turn right back into evil magic and this one we seen the real magic at the magic at its finest now this magic you hit, see right here with the horns the sword interesting right kind of got like horn sword trident kind of look just like shiva we dealing with Hinduism again. Shout outs to the Hindu gods. Look at how Shiva is and look at how magic is. The trident, the type of horn thing, like the Vikings, they did excellent with this. The same type of concept as being a guardian. That's what magic is. That's how magic storyline is as well. Uh, um, the, the, the kind of extra powers of the... the Telepathy and beyond the physical realm concepts, same thing with magic. So just needed to point that out and it's phenomenal how they did that. But when Morph turned into magic and then got evil, things got a little crazy. So the rest of the X-Men now, they focused, they forgot, they couldn't worry about um, Goblin Queen. They worried about this evil magic. While they fighting this evil magic coming at them, Magneto is basically fighting Goblin Queen 101. And Magneto at first looks like he about to destroy her again, try to give a warning. But Goblin Queen is like, yo, you just do magnetism. That doesn't have no effect on my telekinesis. I can shred right through your magnetism. And she basically kind of overpowers him and hurts him. Like it was crazy to see how Magneto couldn't stop himself from getting cut and ble was, was bleeding. So now while this is happening and Magneto's getting wounded, Magneto just is on the floor now. Cyclops saves him, blasts her, and he's the first one that actually hurt the Goblin Queen. Literally made her bleed. And she's like, yo, I like the taste of blood. It's like real wicked how she is. But as Cyclops does this, she's like, oh, I love you though. I love the taste of blood. You're my baby, basically. And kind of stopped him from being aggressive. She went up to him and kind of tricked him, took his powers away. And it's like, not taking his powers away. He's like taking his will to fight away. Just like with more. And like kind of starting to turn him against them, it seems like. But that's when we see, right, we go right into Wolverine. Wolverine is with Jean. And they like, while the X-Men are getting beat up by the Goblin Queen, Wolverine's, Jean wakes up like, oh, I need, they need me. And Wolverine is like, nah, beast and Wolverine like, calm down. 
Wolverine like, like, listen, bro, you, I'm mean, listen, Gene, you just don't know where you are, but just read my mind. So Gene reads Wolverine mind. This I think is gonna really lead into moving forward. Gene realizes how much Wolverine actually loves her. And when she realizes this, she must also realize something else because she immediately says, wait a minute, Cyclops, you just reminded me, I gotta go help Cyclops right now. And they're like, yo, you can't use your body, your body not ready. And she's like, no, I'm gonna use my mind. So she does this stuff without Cerebro and she kind of like taps into a whole new energy. Now, we gotta talk about this. We brought this up already. Gene came and saved them and we see the Phoenix. You could just kind of tell the Phoenix was gonna have to make an appearance. Phoenix comes out now. Now this is how it happens. Jean comes in to save Cyclops before she takes Cyclops' will to fight or whatever. With the same thing she did to Morph, turn Cyclops against them. So when she does this, Jean comes in, destroy, well, they, it's not a destroy. She basically takes Goblin Queen out of the mansion with si in Sinister's mansion and basically puts her into this power, this new universe that they're in and they're both of their minds. It's, it's big, this is so deep, but it's like Phoenix basically came through from Gene and basically fused the clone and the real Gene together. So both of them are going through this memory lane. The most important part about this is how once they fused, they went back right the first thing. Like I said, y'all told you guys before, the childhood memories, things, the desires in the childhood, the experiences, either letting those go or bringing them back into your life are very important. So they went back to the childhood to try to figure out what happened. Why, where did my powers, where did I start really getting a love or desire for my powers? And that's when you see Professor X. Professor X at the door like, yo, you know who I am? And he's talking to the parents and Jean and then he starts to use his powers and talk to her mind. So Jean and the Goblin Queen, they're back there just watching it together. They both have different reactions. The Goblin Queen is looking at it like, I already know all this stuff. Because the Goblin Queen, like I said, fresh memory, so she got all this stuff fresh. The new, the Jean is like, wait a minute, why? I'm just remembering this stuff. And then she sees that during that same interaction when she got picked up, she felt like she messed up badly because her best friend got into a car accident right there and she wasn't able to use her powers to save her friend. So she said basically at that moment, she realized that's the real reason why she even got involved and wanted to go with Professor X because she wanted to like be a hero. But basically it's so deep. That accident that potentially happened, that was Jean Grey's basic her moment, the, the real Jean Grey. Now Goblin Queen or the clone Jean Grey, she basically had her moment. It really was both, but, but the main ones was when she seen the birth of Nathan. The birth of the baby made the clone gene or goblin queen realize, wait a minute, I don't care about no Mr. Sinister. Even if I was created or not, that's not strong enough to make me be evil. I want my child. That's all I want. I don't want Mr. Sinister to take over. And that's when she realizes and they all realize, yo, Mr. Sinister basically had this evil plan to use the baby, clone him and use him to, or whatever they're going to do to generate more mutants and soldiers like we said with joseph Mengele, the same type of concept making a super race of, of mutants but when this happens and she sees the baby she's like i can't let mr sinister do that so now we can say the phoenix credited gets the credit of giving both of them this nirvana type feeling think remember we're talking about the hinduism even we get into buddhism and all this stuff the concepts of karma nirvana deep stuff here but this moment of, wait a minute, the clone gene realizes, I don't care about what Mr. Sinister wants, I want my baby good. I don't want my baby to be no, no lab experiment. And Gene is like, yo, all I really want is my real life. I just did this because my friend died, but I let that go and, and I just wanna move forward. So it's this epiphany going on and then Mr. Sinister at that moment realizes, oh no, this is not good. I, if I don't have, I thought I just had both of them on my side, now I'm done. And he backs away, they try to blast, they blast him, they hurt him. He tries to fight them back, but he can't, he couldn't fight the Goblin Queen and Gene. And so, and the whole X-Men. So once he realized he didn't have the Goblin Queen on his side and his powers basically didn't work, he I guess he thought it was permanent. He basically backs up and, and retreats right before getting killed. 
guess what? The way that Mr. Sinister leaves in this scene right here in episode three is just like how the Nazi soldiers and commanders and generals who left and had to go on trial for the Nuremberg trial in World War II where these people who did all these heinous, gruesome crimes, they were put on trial. People from the Operation Paperclip got away and they went to different places and we'll say America, Latin America, whatever you want to call it. But if you look up the records and history of Joseph Mengele, he literally started a new life in Latin America where people didn't know him. Interesting stuff right there with a girlfriend that he even was dating and is real popular of not knowing that this is who she was dating. Someone who was called and known as the Angel of Death. Joseph Mengele, Mr. Sinister. This is a way that you end this stuff off right here. So they save Nathan, they get him out of this machine, but right when he saved him, Mr. Sinister lets him know, hey, I'm still that evil guy, remember? He's not gonna survive. He has this strain of some techno virus thing all over Nathan's body. So they basically saying that, he basically saying that Nathan's not gonna survive. If I can't have the child as my superhuman, my super mutant, y'all can't have a meter. So that's basically how that last scene ends. Crazy, deep, powerful, but a lot of stuff going on in that between all that action. So now let's wrap this up and get into the last scene of the episode. This is where we see Beast doing his research. We saw him like Yakub already. We already kind of made references of how he broke down the whole Dr. Victor Frankenstein reference. Now we got the Dr. Fauci reference. He's breaking down and analyzing this advanced C-19 medical lab strain. Isn't that interesting? Isn't this interesting? So just like that, some new bam virus just pops up a new strain or something pops up okay cool this person is breaking it down and, and letting us know what it is and now saying no no it's gonna be hard to get a cure so that's what beast is basically saying it's impossible to get a cure right now but then what do what does we need we need an emergency cure we need an emergency vaccine does that sound familiar it very interesting when you break this whole thing down with the C-19 size. I'm not going to get too deep in there. I know how that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. But if you, by this time, you either know or you don't know. It doesn't, I ain't nothing to really say right now. If somebody has to break that down to you, you got a lot of research that you, you should probably start doing immediately. Everybody else I'm talking to who already did all that and knows what they know, they already know what it is. There's nothing to really talk about. That's why it's easy at this point. They kind of, that kind of went backwards on them with that. So now he's working on the strain and they like, yo, we need an emergency cure. So Cyclops is like, yo, wait a minute, Bishop, since your, 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 your device is working, don't you have some cures in the future? And Bishop is like, nah, I don't got the cures, but I know scientists who can definitely make that cure and he can be cured in no time if he comes to the future. So Beast is like, all right, let's go. Let's all, I mean, Cyclops is like, yo, let's all go to the future. But this is when Bishop and Beast is like, yo, there's only enough machine. There's not enough juice in there for everybody. So it only can bring me and Nathan. So all Bishop can bring is the baby. So Cyclops and Gene is like, oh, wait a minute. So that means we got to we, we gotta stay back. We got to let you just take our baby and we can't go. And this is where the deadbeat dad talk comes in. Shout outs again to all of the writers of X-Men 97, they're doing a great job getting melts multiple, multiple phenomenal and major target market audience members who would love this content. When you get into the deadbeat dads, we, a lot of us can relate. I'm definitely one who can relate. When you have to grow up in that situation, not everyone, not everyone can relate, but especially if you didn't have that situation, you can appreciate and be grateful for something that you have and that maybe at sometimes you might not be as grateful for because you don't realize that there are a lot of people who didn't have this at all and yearn for it on a daily basis basically that's kind of how bad it gets until you can get over that so yeah it's some deep stuff that that comes up but cyclops is just like most 
I'm gonna say this from what I know and from what I'm seeing, most of us who came from like a deadbeat dad situation, they have a desire to be the best parents that they can be. They have a desire to make sure they never do what their deadbeat dad did to them. Cyclops shows and highlights this beyond words. It makes people a fan of Cyclops automatically for seeing how he's standing on business about his son and being a father. Parenting is important, not just for fathers, but mothers as well. This goes for both sides of the coin. We already know. But it's, I know people who see this and they can relate. They're going to respect that. Even if you just respect the concept of someone being a good dad. We don't get to see that in movies at all, let alone the news. And how is a cartoon showing us this so perfectly? So shout out to them for that. But I can't lie. Cyclops crashes out. He crashed out though. Like I don't think he took it. They took it too far. But that is how it goes. That's what you do for your son. I, I'm for your child. I absolutely admit that I crashed out like this multiple times when it comes to my kids. I mean, that's kind of where my line is. Like anything with them, that's where the crash out is pretty much automatic. If you just want to see that happening, you just gotta prepare for what's gonna the consequences of pushing that line. But that's just the reality. So Cyclops was like, yo. I'm not letting y'all do, I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm not going to be no deadbeat dad. Haven't y'all had deadbeat dads? None of y'all can relate. He just bashing everybody like, yo, nobody can relate, but nobody not saying anything. So maybe they can't relate, Cyclops. And so he's like, yo, I can't watch this. He leaves. I just don't like how he didn't give any last words, basically. I mean, he kind of did. Whatever his last words were, his last words. And he said he showed love to Nathan. Nathan. But once he found out he couldn't go, he basically just stormed out the room. Yeah, stormed out the room. Yeah, we're going to bring into that. So now, Gene basically is like, all right, this has to happen. Let me just give him my last words. So she basically brings him to a lake. They talking, having their last words, showing love. Bishop is waiting. Bishop is like, yo, time to go. Grabs the baby. It's deep. Bishop got the portal open. And then he takes Nathan to the future. And then we're going to see there. I'm going to let y'all know right now, you know, as listeners and um, people who are supporting, if you don't know the true story of Nathan, I don't want to necessarily spoil it for you. But all I'm going to say is um, if you're into the concept of Bishop, the character of Bishop, you're going to see somebody who is going to be like Bishop on a whole nother level. I actually I love I'm a big fan of Bishop, but the person who Nathan ends up becoming is a is a superhero is a is a uh, mutant that you're gonna love so just keep that in mind i'm not gonna say any names and if you know you we can talk about it in the comment section but i don't want to spoil anybody i'm not here for that i'm here to really break down and give good content on this stuff so now as this whole thing ends up now we get into the whole real versus fake again but this time the real gene is accepting of the fake gene or the clone gene and basically she's like listen when the phoenix came into our lives and it merged both of us to the point where it's hard for me to even know who's the real one and he's she's like i can tell that you know just as much as i know about my life and we both have the same understandings of each other's highlights and low points so we basically are one right now so she's like basically i'm gonna take my life the real gene says i'm gonna take my life and i'm moving away and from now on, you're going to be able, you can call me Madeline Pryor. Choose your own life. Think about that. We spoke about it. The psychological concepts. You get to choose your life. Every time you get up, every time you wake up, it's like receiving a winning lottery ticket. You get to choose. Go cash that in and go enjoy your life. Choose which steps you want to take, what path you want to go, what direction you want to go. And anytime you say, I can't, I won't, I don't, is you saying these words and you manifesting your own negative energy to push you back and fence you into your own concepts. So now nah, that whole concept of the real gene, um, giving respect to the um, clone gene or goblin queen, we just going to call it goblin, I mean clone gene now because it doesn't really make, oh, we just call this gene gray now. That's where it's going to get real deep. Let's talk about this for a second. Real Gene is saying, I'm leaving now and call me Madeline Pryor. The clone Gene, who was Goblin Queen, is like, I'm the real Gene now. I'm going to stay back with the X-Men. Gets real deep when you think about that. Real deep when you think about that. Who's going to be the Phoenix and who's going to be the Dark Phoenix 
if y'all know about that, it's two different types. So that's where I can, you can see how that's being set up. And that might be a real good thing for the future. So they got like a trump card to use if the X-Men really need help. Especially, y'all know, one of the biggest bosses and villains in the X-Men is Apocalypse. That's like the Danos or Galactus or whatever. However you want to look at it, the Apocalypse is Big Dog. One of the big dogs. So at this point now, we have some of... They have been doing real good with the writing and the cliffhangers. But these are good cliffhangers right here. First off, we see clone, we see, I don't want to call it clone Jean now, but yeah, because we know the original Jean Grey is Madeline Pryor from this move, from moving forward now. Clone Jean is Goblin Queen when she was evil, and now we just gonna call her Jean Grey. She's the original Jean now. That's all we got, that's all we could do it. So this clone Jean, who is the original Jean now, we just gonna say Jean, I just wanna keep everybody aware, is alone with Cyclops. Remember how that ended? Cyclops is mad that he wasn't able to go with Nathan. So is Cyclops going to accept the fact that this Gene, who's not even the real Gene, just allowed the baby to go like that? Is Cyclops going to realize that, hey, even though this wasn't the real Gene, I didn't actually have the baby with the real Gene. I had the baby with this same clone Gene. So, and if they're the same and their real Gene accepted this clone Gene and calls herself Madeline Pryor, do I love Madeline Pryor or do I love Jean Grey? It is so deep how this really breaks down. They did that perfect. But we can't forget one of the best cliffhangers is we see this scenery and they're in Texas at this bar and Storm is at the bar just chilling, relaxing, looking at the news, talking about the weather. And some man just comes up to her in the bar like, yeah, man, we, we wish you could have a rainstorm or something like that. And he's making all this weather references. And she's like, yo, just say what you want to say. Stop playing games with you. If you know who I am, just say who you are. He's like, yo, I'm Forge. And I'm here to help you get your powers back. Cliffhanger. Fire. Powerful. They did good. Episode three. Fire made flesh. Those themes. You want to learn about um dante's inferno this is a good place you can go see that concepts about real versus fake psychological attitudes about moving forward in life and progression you can get that if you want to learn about what the fear of ai and clone technology is you're going to be able to see and feel that the concepts of a mad scientist an evil genius you get the roots of that then you also get some world war ii background of how gruesome things were with homicides and I mean with Holocaust and the concept of the genocide and how it relates to genocides we can see in our modern day life and how a genocide or a concept of Holocaust can have different forms. Sad to say, but it's a harsh reality. But that's not what we're here for. Let's enjoy life. If y'all haven't seen this episode, I hope this was something that helped you get a good vibe to want to go see it. Or if you just say, hey, this actually made me, rec I know with the whole episode, I have a few people who says they want me to keep doing this because it's actually keeping them up to date with the episodes. That's what I'm here for, however it goes. But check out, continue to check them out. Check out the other videos on the channel. Make sure you subscribe, like, share, all that stuff. Keep it up. The chat and the comment sections are the best. You guys are hilarious. Laugh every day. I learn something new every day. You teaching me different techniques. Y'all let me know about what's going on with the editing and all that. I love all that. I'm here for it. The history, the knowledge. Let's talk. Let's debate. Let's unite. All love, peace, and blessings. Take care, everybody. One love.